Can you all please uh, sit down, take your seats? Be quiet, please. So it's my um, uh, pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, uh, Loic Yengo, who is an um, associate professor in statistical genetics at the University of Queensland. It's been an absolute highlight in my career to be able to um, recruit uh, Loic uh, now nearly eight years ago and to see his career uh, flourish. It's a real privilege, I think, in academia to hire people who are much sm uh, smarter than yourself. Uh, and it's also, uh, for me, a great pleasure to now have Loic as a, both a collaborator and a, and a friend. Loic, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, um, Peter, for the very kind introduction. I should definitely get you a beer or more than one. Okay, so uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I'm ex extremely excited. I have to say yesterday, the program was fantastic and I didn't, it didn't even need to fight my jet lag. I was just carried over by all the science and the, the great ideas floating around the room. So uh, today I'll be telling you about a trait that we all know and love to paraphrase what Arcus said yesterday. And so it's a trait that has been the flagship trait of quantitative genetic studies for uh, more than a century now. And one of the reasons is because it's a trait that is very easy to measure and it has a large heritability. So I'll be talking about some of the recent uh, findings we've learned about its architecture. And towards the end of my talk, I will highlight some uh, unresolved questions and controversies. But before that, just wanted to uh, answer a question that uh, I've, I've had over the past few days, I actually, predate from ever since we published that paper last year. So no, I'm not retiring just yet. And if I do, it's not gonna be in DC. So it's gonna be somewhere on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, in, I'll invite you there sometime. Uh, but more seriously, uh, so in this talk, I will start with um, a sort of general reflection about what it means for high to be a model trait. At least, you know, it's a very vast question, but I'll try to sketch a few ideas there. I'll then talk about some of our recent discoveries that, that will be the bulk of the presentation. And uh, towards the end, I'll um, brush over some unresolved questions and maybe share with you a more like a wish list of what we can learn together. So why is height a good model? Um, I believe it's, I said at the beginning, it's easy to measure. It has a large heritability. That's probably what makes it uh, appealing uh, to study, uh, but it's, what is interesting here is actually, besides heritability, its genetic architecture pretty much resembles that of any other complex traits. And this is a, a picture from uh, Zeng et al. 2021. I think Naomi yesterday showed that picture as well. And as a consequence, we, we hope that when studying height, that what we were going to learn would somehow generalize uh, to other complex traits. But in practice, what, ex what exactly does it mean, generalize? What, uh, what do we hope things will what are the things that we hope will generalize? I guess the, straight, the straightforward answer to that question is mostly methods. But here I'll try to go a bit more some, somehow further and think uh, can large genetic studies of height also improve more generally uh, gene mapping of other traits? And, and I'll argue that the answer to that question is maybe. Uh, if you think about, uh, you know, in the context of methods, like MTAG, where you can borrow information for, from genetically correlated traits, you can imagine that having very large uh, studies of height could also improve mapping for other traits. Um, I think large genetic studies of height could also improve our general understanding of biological mechanisms. And I'm having a particular um, experiment in mind with this sort of village experiment that has been mentioned yesterday a couple of times. Uh, and the reason why I think height could be a good candidate for this is because of effect sizes. So in this sort of typical village, village experiment, we are ascertaining participants at the tail of the polygenic score distribution. But when you think about it, how much uh, contrast you have at the tail of the, the polyg polygenic score distribution is a function of the prediction accuracy. And so for many uh, existing uh, experiments and, and uh, you know, attempts to answer questions using that, that, that framework, uh, I believe we, we've been mostly underpowered and height could play an interesting uh, um, role there. And so the third, the third point is a bit of a leap, right? I uh, don't quote me on that. Height will not directly improve our ability to discover a new medicine for cancer. 
but there's just wanted to flag that there, there have been in the literature examples of models or study that have thought about using height as a way to prioritize uh, new medicine by looking at uh, variants that both increase and uh, for which loss of function variants are both gain or um, increase or decrease the expression. Uh, but besides thinking about uh, what are the properties of height or genetic studies of height that can generalize to other complex traits, you can also think about it in somewhat different terms. You, we can think about what hypotheses have, be, have we been able to test or generate uh, using height as a model. And so among the tested hypotheses, I think maybe the, the most um, uh, important one has been that complex traits are polygenic and that their heritability can be mapped to a single variant resolution. And so that was uh, hypothesizing, hypothesizing the uh, Yang, Yang 2010 paper uh, way before we had enough data to actually test that hypothesis. And we've been, I guess, with our last GWAS last year, have been able to, to get very close to and to validate that hypothesis. And as we start getting more genetic data on height, we can also test uh, hypotheses about the natural selection, for example, by looking at how it, it acts on changing and modifying allele frequencies that are trait associated variants. And uh, just another example uh, that also height has been used as a way to, uh, to answer a very broad question about what are the forces that are explaining the loss of prediction accuracy uh, for polygenic score between populations. Um, their height has also sort of helped generate new hypotheses. So by new, I, I, I don't mean that those things were not known before. I mean that because we start observing them with height, uh, that prompted questions about how much that generalized to other traits. And so one of them is uh, allelic heterogeneity. We, we talked about it before or uh, yesterday, I mean, but I think in height, for height, it's, a, it's quite interesting because the, the very, very early GWASs of height in 2010 already flagged this pro interesting property of height that the height associated variant tend to be clustered you know, next to each other in the genome. And that is something that we, we continue to see, and I will cover that in the, the, the remainder of my talk. Uh, there is another interesting hypothesis about the presence of rare non-coding variants with large effects. And so this is, um, I guess, it's maybe mostly driven by technologies because now we have large samples with whole genome sequences. But uh, it's inter interesting that in this uh, whole Dawson paper, the flag, uh, and this particular example where you have this UTR variance that has an effect that is larger than any coding variance. And so how much that generalizes to other traits is also interesting and something we should uh, try to investigate in the future. And uh, finally, in another hypothesis, I think that was prompted by studying height is uh, to which um, extent that we saturate our biological interpretation of GWAS findings as we increase sample sizes. And this is something I will cover toward the end of my talk. So just to summarize this part, uh, the genetic architecture of height largely resembles that of other traits. Uh, height has been mainly used as a model for gene mapping and method development. Uh, I think at this point in time, it's unclear whether height will, will remain the flagship trait for some of our post-GUAS uh, mechanistic studies. I believe it's still, it's still a good candidate for the, the, the point I made earlier about the effect sizes. And uh, finally, uh, height has enabled complex hypotheses to be tested empirically and also led to generate new ones. So in the second part of this talk now, I'm gonna cover some of the recent discoveries we've made. And it's mostly based, going to be based on our uh, GWAS of, of height published last year with 5 million participants. But before that, this slide is mostly to highlight that this has been a long journey. You, know, you don't get to 5 million just, just, you know, just like that, right? It's, a, it's been a journey. So before the GWAS era, what what we knew mostly about the architecture of height came from uh, family-based studies, and we knew we had estimates of heritability between 0.7 and 0.8, and those studies were mostly done in European ancestry populations. And so I'm sort of going fast uh, on this timeline, but from you know the early days of GWAS to uh, 22, uh, which are the, the result I'm going to cover most in mostly in details in the next few slides. What we what we've learned is essentially that we can map that heritability to single variant resolution from detecting just under about 27 loci to now over to 12,000 loci, explaining pretty much all the state-based heritability. So on this timeline, just wanted to highlight a few, I think, important milestones. I think one of them 
was the sort of cup, uh, constant update of estimates of SNP-based heritability. I think that has played a major role in sustaining the momentum in the GWAS discovery. And two other points are the UK Biobank. I think it stands at its own as a, as a milestone. And I will say similar to that also, which has contribute to, contributed to boost sample sizes is the uh, collaboration with direct-to-consumer com companies. So let's now talk about the mother of all GWASs. So, okay, no reaction. Everybody's is expected me to be that cocky. Uh, so this study was with 5 million participants, heavily uh, European uh, buys, but that's uh, not an, an, that, it's no news for GWASs. But I just wanted to highlight that this study uh, st is still commendable because we had more than a million participants whose ancestries are outside of Europe. And so we fo mostly focused on this uh, panel of SNPs called the HATMA3 SNP panel. Uh, it, good and bad, but I think maybe what's interesting about the panel is that it contains variants that are largely uh, common in, in all of those ancestry groups. And so these are uh, some of the questions we asked in that study. We wanted to discover how associated variants and characterize their genomic distribution. We wanted to estimate how much variance they, they explain and, 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 and parallel that with missing heritability. We did some prediction work, but in the interest of time, I will not cover this in this uh, in the pre presentation. And then we we, we sort of uh, quantify the level of saturation of GWASs at different levels. So the first thing we did was to run GWASs in each of those groups. So this is uh, you know the number bar plus showing the number of hits we just, we detected in each group. Uh, and which pretty much mirrors the sample sizes. And then before combining everything, we, we, start, we essentially compared effect sizes between those ancestry groups. And what we found is that they were largely consistent uh, and in a way that it was sort of made sense to use uh, a fixed effect meta-analysis to move forward. Um, once we identify, after running this, this fixed effect meta-analysis, we identified about 12,000 variants and we ask uh, what, what is their genomic distribution? And so we developed this measure of uh, density, which essentially ask, so it's a per SNP measure, and we're asking for each SNP how many other independent associations are shared at that particular location. And so uh, when we do that, we see that on average across the genome, each of those 12,000 variants tend to share their location with two other independently associated variants. And, and we in particular flag this locus on chromosome 15 that has a density of about 25 uh, independent association within just 200 KB window. And so this locus was known before to be, uh, to show some allylic heterogeneity, but we wanted to go a bit further and, and trying to characterize what could be the patterns that have led to that high density. So we tested a few hypotheses, sorry for the busy slide, but essentially panel A, B, C, D are asking a, si a simple question is how much that density can be due to untagged rare uh, haplotypes at that particular locus. And running simulations, uh, haplotype analysis, et cetera, the conclusion here is, uh, well, it's not the most plausible explanation of that high density. But interestingly, uh, that locus was also shown to uh, harbor this uh, variable number tandem repeat, uh, which also showed association with height. And in particular, if we, if we re you, regress, uh, you quantify the variance explained in that copy number variance, in that the VNTR var variation uh, explained by the 25 variants at the locus, well, we, we have a pretty good tagging. I think in South Asian, we reach about 80% of that variable number uh, tagging um, variation that is explained by those 25 variants. But nevertheless, this sort of uh, bottom right panel is showing that if if you add those SNPs on top of the VNTR, you still had more variation. And so the interpretation here is high density is both a reflection of untagged, more complex variation, but it's not just that. It's also evidence that we have a lot of uh, heterogeneity happening there. And so this was work done in collaboration with uh, um, Paul Rillo and Ronan um, McCamill in Harvard. And so the second question we ask about at high density is to which extent it will ref it reflects um, enrichment of genes that are known to you know affect to to lead to to extreme skeletal growth phenotypes. And so we had a list of about uh, just hundred under five hundred genes, and by and large we found that you know, we have a significant enrichment of high density nearby uh, you know genomic regions where those genes are. And this is significant over and above in null distributions um, from genes that are randomly sampled but matched on, on the length. 
And so the, the right panel is essentially showing a, a very clear monotonic relationship between density and enrichment. And so uh, I wouldn't, I couldn't some, you know, finish a talk uh, to the section on architecture uh, without showing this kind of plot. So this is something we, we showed on the paper, in the paper about this is re the relationship between frequency and effect sizes for the 12,000 variants. But I also wanted to flag a follow-up analysis we, we, we've done in a subsequent paper published sometime this year, um, where we, we condition on those 12,000 variants and we ran an exome-wide association study in the UK Biobank. So the point there was to detect variants that were independent uh, from the ones we identified last year. Uh, and also uh, we wanted to see how far those new uh, signals were from what we identified last year. And so this plot here is showing that, you know, on the x-axis you have the LE frequency. So we went all the way down to 10 to the minus four, and that allows us to detect very large effect uh, coding variants. But interestingly, so each of those dots are colored by their proximity uh, to the height and the low side that we identified last year. And what we found is that the vast majority of them are, are sitting within just about 100 kV for most of them. So that's also confirming that even for the missing heritability, at least the, the rare variant heritability, there is um, a concentration nearby those low side. So um, once we identify those uh, 12,000 variants, we define height associated loci by essentially uh, extending uh, small windows about 35 kb around each of those SNPs. And so that by doing so, we, we can partition the genome into any kind of variation that lies within those loci versus outside. And so when you partition the, ge the genome this way and you perform a partition SNP-based heritability analysis, we found that um, even beyond the half 3 SNPs that we, we have analyzed, that 100% of the heritability in European ancestry population is contained in those loci. And in other ancestry groups, it doesn't reach 100%, although you know, standard errors are what they are, but it's interesting that more than 90% of that common, common variant uh, SNP-based heritability is contained in those loci. So that was quite surprising and exciting. And we thought, okay, but how far does it go? Because we have common variants. We have some ideas that some rare variants can go there, but is that, is that a pattern that is observed? Are we essentially uncovered all loci containing all the heritability of height? And so we're trying to answer that partially in the paper last year by essentially repeating this analysis by lowering uh, our in inclusion threshold to one in a thousand, not just 1%, we went down to one in a thousand. And that also confirmed the pattern, uh, but I'm now showing uh, unpublished result that we generated earlier this year, which is based on uh, whole genome sequence data uh, released in the UK Biobank. So this is a partition analysis. So I'll just walk, I'm gonna walk you through it. Through it. So this is height based on 154 uh, in unrelated participants. And so we have our so essentially four math groups, like for 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus three, uh, up to 50%. Uh, 50%. And so what you see, for each of those math beans, we have LD you know, groups, so don't pay attention to the LD groups, but if you just focus on the colors, so the color, the blue colors are the height low side. So we do confirm the pattern that essentially all the heritability for common variants up to lower frequency variant is containing those low side. But what I want to draw your attention to is for the rarest bean, it seems like this pattern start to be broken up a little bit. So we have a bit more, uh, the enrichment is not as strong. So this is essentially telling us that there is a causal genetic variation for height outside those loci. Uh, the question to which I don't have the answer now is how far away from those loci that generate that uh, um, heritability is, uh, I don't know at the moment. So now I'm gonna talk about saturation of GWASs. So the way we approached that was essentially by Re, uh, revisiting some of our previous GWASs and essentially downsample our large study. And so by doing so, we generated new sets of independent associations. And we, we first looked at uh, what happens in terms of the number of uh, variants that you detect as you increase sample size. So as you increase sample size, you do increase the number of SNPs that you detect, that's the blue curve. But consistent with that sort of enrichment or sort of clustering of high variants, we found that as soon as you start defining low psi with say a window of 100 KB, you clearly see saturation. So meaning that the new variant that you detect when you increase sample size are within the low psi you, pre you pretty much identified before. Um, so we wanted to see uh, how does it translate in terms of saturation for enrichment for in a biological um, you know, 
pathways or gene sets. So apologies for this very busy slide. So, but what we did here is that we, first of all, used two methods, a uh, code, method called depict and magma. Those methods are for uh, quantifying enrichment in a functional in a pathways. Uh, and what we did then is that we clustered the pathways into 20 clusters of pathways, a very high level analysis. But the bottom line is that if, for example, we focus on depict, as we increase sample size, as we go from this row to this row, what we see is that the clusters of pathways that we implicate with a sample size of 130,000 are pretty much the same as the ones we implicate with 5 million. And so this is essentially telling us that the saturation, at least conditional on the kind of biology we know at this point in time, the saturation doesn't need 5 million participants. So just to summarize, our big GWAS uh, identified 12,000 uh, independent associations clustered within about 7,000 non-overlap loci. Uh, and those cover about 21% of the genome. And what's special about it is that more than 90% of the common state-based heritability is contained in those loci. Uh, I haven't shown any of the prediction results, but interestingly, we do find that our best polygenic score outperforms the parental average. I think that was notable enough to be uh, underlined in, this, in the paper. Uh, and we've now reached saturation in terms of pathway and gene set uh, uh, prioritization. So I'm not sure how I'm doing with time. I'm just jumping to the last uh, uh, three, 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll be quick. So uh, just about the unresolved question. So I'll, I have two slides on this. Um, one is the still missing heritability. So I think um, we, we, have, we, we can explain about 70% of height variance with whole genome sequence data, which uh, I think it still leaves about 10 or 15% if you consider the, the heritability from twin study to be 85% difference uh, that is not explained. Uh, what, what could be the gap here? So uh, I think yesterday, um, uh, Arcus uh, was underlining that twin studies can be uh, confounded and, for example, can also be inflated because of something like common environmental effects. And so what we, we've been able to do is uh, that we use it, uh, an orthogonal design based on segregation variance in a large number of you know, uh, sibling pairs. So this is unpublished re results. Uh, but what we found with this analysis is that if you use segregation variants and you can sort of tease apart the part that's coming from uh, shared environmental effects, is that we are getting very close estimate to the one that we had from pedigree, uh, pedigree based, uh, twin based studies. So maybe it's not much the common environmental effect that is causing the problem, maybe it's something else. This is uh, an open question. And so uh, other questions we would like to answer in the future is what are the biological mechanisms uh, underlying underlying uh, high causing genetic variation. This is a very broad question, but essentially what we need and that which we don't know, we don't have at this point in time, is a lot of omic data on growth relevant tissues. I think we would definitely need that, more of that. And I believe that will also help uh, fast track some of the functional studies for other traits. Uh, the missing heritability, I, I talked about it. Uh, I think we definitely need uh, larger samples with whole genome sequence data and larger family studies. I think. Uh, ideally, not just sibling pairs, because that will allow us to potentially tease apart contribution from non-additive genetic variants. Uh, and fin finally, uh, fine mapping. I think we haven't talked about it much so far. I think yesterday, uh, maybe today we'll talk more about it, but we definitely need to get at the causal variants uh, behind those associations. And that will require new models, uh, new data, and definitely more diverse genetic um, samples. So this is my last slide. Um, so on the genetic architecture, I think I'm probably not gonna repeat myself. I'll just jump to the last point is, is height, does height has a future as a, as a model for complex traits? I, I believe yes, because the advantage that, um, in terms of sample size will remain for the foreseeable future. And there's a lot to do in terms of neurobiological translation there. Uh, but there is a downside. I think with biobanks, we have, lots of traits available to us all the time. And this sort of special status of height as a model trait is somehow undermined in this context. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I uh, just uh, thank all my colleagues uh, in this work that I brushed very quickly about over 25 minutes uh, involved a lot of collaborators. So I just wanna thank them, the funding bodies and uh, the department. Thank you so much.
so Loic, uh, yes. that amazing. Uh, my question is about the, the variance that sort of the rare variance that's outside of the height hits, and thinking of that in a sort of constraint framework, right? So those would be variants that hit a gene where there's no common variance for height. Do you expect those to be sort of like core genes or genes that are in you know intolerant to permutation? Like, because that's interesting, right? That suddenly we find you find new new genes or new places in the genome that aren't under the influence of common variation. Are uh, they special? Should we seek those out? So it's a, it's a great great question. Thanks, Michelle, for the question. I, I believe um, I don't have the answer to that question. First of all, uh, but I think part of it is. It, I'll tell you what I need before I start investigating that question. I'll need to know um, how far this sort of residual heritability is from the loci, because when you think about it, the way we define loci is quite arbitrary, and we use a 35 kb window, which we found was quite extraordinarily, extraordinarily small uh, and for the common variants, but maybe for the rare variants, we need to go 100 kb. And, and if we go 100 kb away and we capture that heritability, then it changes, sort of changes the, the nature of the, the investigation. But I'll definitely look into that. Um, in explaining the 10% still missing heritability, you, you didn't mention something that you've worked on yourself, which is even rarer variants. So do you think that they explain some of the missing 10%? Uh, thanks, Mike, for the question. Uh, so yeah, I. I couldn't cover everything, uh, 25 minutes, not a lot, um, but I'm not complaining, I'm just saying. Uh, but yeah, so the evidence for the extreme, the, the rare tale of the, the frequency distribution, it, it is quite hard. I think we have estimates of just about two, 3%, but you know, who knows if that's you know, confounded by stratification. I think that's, that's the, the unknown there. Uh, it's possible, I think, you know, using the, we have this interesting conundrum where, whereby estimate from segregation variants using either sibling pairs or more complex pedigrees leads to somewhat different estimates. And the, the estimates from more complex pedigrees are supposedly not capturing non-additive genetic variants. So it would be great, first of all, to try and replicate that in a different data set. I think the only data point we have for that observation came from decode. So if we need, first of all, need to replicate that. And if it holds, yeah, maybe that gap will come from, could come from non-additive genetic variants, but I need to see the data. Um, thank you, this is really great work over many years. So, and you're lucky to bring us back to that. Two brief ones. One is, what does the distribution of the variants um, say with respect to identification or not of the 462 skeletal genes? And my second question, in a way, is far more trivial, that if you added more variants, if the height itself was less accurately measured, which is the case for most you know, traits, how much of your observations would really degrade? Meaning that some of the observations are probably more stable than others. That is, if you added more variants, you know, just to the trail. So I have to say, I missed the first part of your question about, so you were asking about genes, the actual identification of genes that are relevant for height. Um, yeah, so th that's, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a problem that holds for most complex traits, but how do you go from this association to the genes? And, and I think one of the reasons why I believe height has been uh, not as well served as other complex traits is because we, we're lacking, I've mentioned that very briefly at the end of my talk, we are lacking, you know, QTL, you know, EQTL data or some molecular data on tissues that are relevant for height, like for the chondrocytes or growth plates. So we have some experiments. Uh, uh, we did actually publish a, a paper earlier this year on this. But I think we'll, we'll need much, much larger uh, investigation of that. So at this point in time, most of the evidence is some, somewhat coming from the, the, the exome-based analysis, where you have a more straightforward uh, connection, and we have you know, hundreds of those genes. Uh, and the OMIM uh, sort of, uh, um, yeah, but there's more to say about OMIM things. But 
So your second point was about, I'm trying to remember the, the quality of the data, the variance of the phenotype. Um, yeah, I, I guess sort of it, it depends, right? I think if you, if, if we talk, if you think about this, this variance coming from, for measurement error, well, I guess what, what you will do essentially just lower inheritability won't necessarily change what the, the associations per se, I guess. Uh, but it's interesting that height is also involved in a lot of things like, you know, participation into studies or assortative mating. And so in a way, if being in a study is related to your height somehow and, and essentially bringing, uh, you know, correlated with other behavioral traits, then maybe we'll be picking up, uh, you know, things that are may, may not be relevant for the process of growing up. Uh, but that's, that's just me extrapolating. Um, uh, I've got a question. Um, hi, yeah. um, I would wanted to draw you on uh, height as a model for disease and conclusions that we could draw or how we should take forward analyses with disease based on your results. So, for example, I think everything's much harder in a binary trait. So hmm. the types of work you've done with the whole genome sequence data, I'm not sure will translate, but some of your work with pathways maybe do translate, so yeah. Yeah, I guess, uh, thanks for the question, Naomi. Uh, it, there's a lot to be said there. I think what, one point is, uh, if you think about the model in terms of, or oh, we are developing methods and would, that can be applied to anything else, uh, yeah, I guess you know a lot of what we've seen here can be applied. But I was thinking maybe more beyond that, conceptually, height could be an interesting model for, for diseases. And I have in mind the, the, I was talking this morning with Greg about disease heterogeneity. And uh, this is a concern in you know uh, consortium when you aggregate data from different sources and you think oh, how much the signals we're picking up are reflecting subtypes of the disease, et cetera. And, and I think it's somewhat overlooked, at least as far I, as I know in some discussions I had with Peter, that it seems like, you know, this height could be an interesting model for disease heterogeneity too. If you think about different body parts, you know, there are many ways to achieve your height. And, and maybe by under developing methods to better dissect that heterogeneity, that potentially inform things we could translate for diseases. But uh, yeah, that's, I think I can. Last question. Hi, hey. Magnus Norberg, Gregor Mendel Institute. So you mentioned fine mapping and like identifying causal sites. So, so what do you actually mean by that, right? We, you know, uh, I've done a lot of this stuff and it, it's, there's no high throughput way really, right? I mean, you can map it down to a region, you can identify causal genes, so you, if you can knock them out or something like that. If you actually want to get to the causal sites, I mean, um, that involves, you know, making constructs, inserting them, and, and, and the limiting factor is not only, you know, the sheer number you have here, but, you know, unless the variants have enough of an effect that you're going to detect it experimentally, I mean, you know, and you can't do the kind of, I mean, I work on plants, you can do these experiments. Very, so, yeah, yeah can you expect? Thank, thanks for the great question. Uh, I, I guess that was the, uh, part of my talk, which where I was, you know, listing unresolved questions, right? And I guess I was also trying to justify why I'm not retiring. Right? So what are the next big things we, we, we are planning and we started doing with this, uh, following this study is, okay, now we have this loci, okay, we have great associations, but can we identify causal vari variation, uh, causal sites for those underlying these associations? And we have lots of new methods out there uh, to do, to, and to do that. Uh, one of the challenges is the sample size, because you really need large samples to be able to break down LD. And so we're sort of working towards much bigger samples to, to try and achieve that. But I think it's not going to be enough. I believe we also have to think about uh, maybe some shift, framework, framework shift in how we think about fine mapping. But I'm happy to just being very elusive now to, to draw attention for coffee uh, discussions afterwards. But eventually, what, what this will mean is we want to be able to make a hypothesis that this region, if you were to CRISPR it, in a cell line that will be in particular effect on growth, uh, for example, growth plate pro proliferation. That could be a great uh, endpoint. We could, you know, if we've done a good job at fine mapping, I hope we'll be able to see this kind of phenotypes uh, 
at the cellular level. All right, thank you so much. We have to. Yes. Ah, perfect. Okay, so. Uh, you know, yesterday Alexander introduced this by showing us a pile of turtles. And, you know, yesterday we spent most of the time talking about the lower part of that pile, looking at organisms and, and molecular phenotypes. In this session, we're going to talk about the top part of the pile, looking at genetic architecture at, at sort of higher levels. And for me, there's sort of two questions here. And I think the prompts we sent out were sort of geared at this, you know, one, by studying trait variation at these higher levels, can we actually learn something about the lower levels? So, um, uh, and then the second thing is, are there sort of aspects of genetic architecture, sort of relevant things which only become apparent or only become relevant at these higher levels? So we're talking about things like indirect effects. And then the kind of overarching question, and this is something that will hopefully go into the discussion is, you know, what are the study designs and data types that we need to collect in order to answer these questions? So we have, uh, three excellent speakers um, addressing different aspects of this. And it's a pleasure to introduce and pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Bogdan Sanik. Thank you so much for for the invitation. Thank you so much for uh, for uh, the amazing lineup of speakers. I'm deeply honored to and equally terrified to sit in front uh, or have you guys in front of me. In many ways, it feels like it's. Uh, passing the qualifying uh, as a grad student and uh, stat gen 101. Um, so I'll touch a little bit about uh, polygenic risk scores and, and the impact of genetic architecture on how we think about polygenic risk scores. And the North Star of the talk today or the, the, the vision that, that my, uh, my talk today will come from is how do we pour these things into medicine? So how do we take these predictions that we have and what's the impact of uh, genetic architecture as we think about taking these predictions towards one patient at a time, let's say, to improve health outcomes. Um, so probably I don't, I don't have to like spend too much time to exemplify the fact that polygenic risk scores has, has emerged as one of the key tools for, for precision medicine, because it, it allows for all these complex traits to potentially lead to identifying you know, high risk cases or uh, improved disease prediction. But the message of my, my, my talk, which I'll get back to it at the end, is that if we want to, uh, to implement uh, polygenic risk scores in, in medicine, we need to make sure that these predictions are well calibrated. And we, because in medicine, in humans, we need to make sure that you know, we, do, we do no harm before we implement any new biomarkers for any new diseases. And here, here's an example of miscalibration in which in a given population labeled here in the blue, our prediction that let's say might be PGS based might have uh, 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 might predict higher risk for individuals that are not as, as high risk, and that causes you know health equity or inequities if we if we predict them. And I I, I challenge ourselves to think about this this calibration or this implementation in humans that it, it's extremely difficult, particularly in the U.S., in which genetic ancestries or or, or any type of ancestry uh, genetically or self-reported. Imp uh, impact genetic architecture, if you will, or genetic architecture varies by, by ancestries, both in terms of the average risk for a given disease in a given population, as well as in the distribution of the risk. And because of these distributions, because of that, when we think about, you know, identifying individuals, uh, especially in a calibrated manner, all those uh, 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 genetic architecture parameters will directly impact one disease at a time, how we, we think about, let's say in this particular case, identifying patients that may have an absolute risk tenfold or above the average in the population, because that's what we would want to do in medical settings. Um, so obviously the biggest you know, elephant in the room here, uh, uh, and I'm listing here one of the beautiful uh, figures from, from Alicia's work in, in the audience that showcases that if we train uh, predictors in European ancestry individuals, they'll perform poorly in non-European ancestry individuals. And that raises a fundamental question, which is, we touched upon it in the past, themselves vary or not across ancestries. And, you know, without going into the, too much details, we can think about partitioning discrepancies in genetic architectures as they, they are completely different by ancestries, 
or whenever they are the same, the causal variants and genes are the same across ancestries, they could have different effects because of all sorts of interactions, or even when they are the same, the frequencies and the LD, the way we tag the causal variant will also be very, very different. Uh, and as you might expect, this is a question that has been studied uh, since the inception of all uh, statistical genetics as a field. Here I'm just listing uh, uh, from, uh, from Sasha's uh, Gustav's work, I'm listing just a highlight of recent work from the past four or five years that la leveraged large scale G uh, G uh, GWAS data to pretty much say that in a uh, uh, in, in low kind of uh, express in the effects, but it varies pretty much depending on the methodology that we use, it varies by trait and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, motivated by this, essentially we try to get to, to, the, 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 to the fundamental question of whether genetic effects are the same or not. And one of the big confounders of all these studies is that by comparing, not just comparing the, the genetics, but we're comparing all the other contexts as well. And all, in many ways, all these studies are inherently confounded by looking at different populations altogether. So to overcome that, we made use of an interesting aspect of a mixed individual. Uh, uh, recent uh, uh, genetic ancestry grouping, for example, African Americans within, within the US, that have a feature that their, their genome is a mosaic of the uh, computationally track and, and figure out what, what, where, where they, they're coming from. And by pulling those, those apart computationally, we can ask the question whether genetic effects are similar or not within the same individuals, within the same population, and in the on these different segments of ancestry within such individuals. And obviously we did that in a polygenic setup. I'm happy to talk to you about the details of this, but it turns out that all the, the, the nice statistical toolkit that uh, puts mixed models to estimate variance parameters can be extendable in this setup. And you can estimate a, a parameter that will give you the covariance or the similarity in the causal effects in, in admixed individuals. And long story short, we found very, very high consistencies from PAGE, it's a consortium from NHLBI, to the UK Biobank, all, all, all the way to all of us. Across all the trades that we looked at, we see a, a very, very high consistency uh, in the effects. So in many ways, we think that causal effects, at least on the common variants with respect to polygenic risk scores, are largely similar. And the lack of portability really comes from differences in frequencies and, and in LD. And now you might ask yourself, how does that occur? Why? Why the, how, the, how do the differences in frequencies and, and, and linkage patterns across uh, uh, genetic diversity cause such a low portability in, in polygenic risk scores? And in order to tackle that, uh, one interesting finding that essentially it's been, uh, it's been around in population genetics for like uh, 50, 60 years, but it's more and more deeply appreciated as we get data from these medical linked Diversity sits on a continuum in humans. So this is a lovely work from uh, last year in science from, from uh, Louis et al. on the left side where they took uh, individuals from, uh, from uh, a biobank within New York City from uh, Mount, Mount Sinai. And you see there in, in gray dots that there'll be uh, individuals from that biobank. They span the entire genetic continuum across all the, these different genetic ancestry sources. When we do the same thing at, at UCLA in, in our biobank, we observe a similar type of, 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 uh, of continuum in which clustering individuals in this broad ancestry groupings, it's, you know, it's a very poor approximation of, of, uh, of uh, how genetic diversity in humans will impact uh, uh, polygenic risk scores. And just to orient yourself, our knowledge about polygenic risk scores portability comes from this idea that we take this continuum of diversity in humans, we kind of like ascribe it to this, uh, this uh, 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 clusters, and then we essentially uh, uh, make statements about the, uh, all the individuals in a given cluster. And of, of course, that, that causes issues. I'll just highlight three of them. The first one is that we are obfuscating uh, uh, diversity within every, any of the TCLA. If you just focus on the Asian ancestry cluster there, 
we find a lot of different diversity that will be it will be missed and will be not you know, present when we understand the coupling of genetic diversity with with uh, with uh, polygenic risk. For example, you see there all sorts of different uh, groupings of individuals that we're, will all be labeled as. Another problem is that, particularly for admixed individuals, the cluster boundaries for this genetically uh, inferred ancestry depends on the method of choice and the reference panel. And we often find the case in real data where pairs of individuals are very similar, but they sit uh, in and or outside of these clusters. So they will be ascribed different, answer, different uh, uh, error, if you will. And then finally, a huge chunk of individuals in the data are really hard to cluster to any of these. And anywhere from four to 10% of all the individuals will be completely left out uh, from characterization of polygenic risk scores because their genetic ancestries are so complex that they cannot be assigned to these, these reference labs. So motivated by this, we thought about how do we integrate a continuum way of, of looking at the impact of, of, uh, uh, of genetic ancestry with genetic architecture for predicting complex traits. And I'm not gonna go to the details of this, but you can show with relatively straightforward assumptions that if an individual is sampled D units away from a training population, and this D unit seem, it, it's kind of a, um, analytically that the correlation between the predictor that comes from the PGS for that individual and its true genetic liability has this form there that depends linearly So now we can go back to the data and then we can drop all the clusterings all together and we can put every individual on this, uh, on, on this genetic ancestry distance. And what we find in the real data, so this is data from the UCLA Biobank, every dot there is one individual. Uh, and then on the Y scale is, is the accuracy of the prediction for that particular individual. We find a remarkable linear relationship. Explain a huge very very variation. Right. Obviously, there's like there are patterns there that tell us that linearity doesn't explain everything. But to a first approximation, uh, the the decay in in performance ancestry groupings again uh, on the on this uh, uh, on this plot, you would see that there's way more variation across individuals than across this genetically inferred ancestry groupings. Um, this is not just a feature of, of one population or other, but this holds in all the, the genetically inferred ancestry groupings that we looked at from all the way from the, the European ancestry individuals, all the way to you know, the uh, unclassified uh, folks. So this is really saying that uh, there's no such thing as homogeneous populations of the genetic diversity in humans. To personalize or find group, groups of individuals across these this different uh, genetic ancestry clusters that might have similar performance. So to a large extent, we think that we can understand pretty well how genetic diversity of the field is, what do we think about the actual polygenic risk scores themselves? And here I'm showing you a plot of polygenic risk score for height on the left side, on the, on the bottom and on the top is that the actual measured height. And they're all plotted as a function of genetic distance. On the right side, you see a different phenotype, neutrophils, which is, I'm sh showing them as, as kind of a, a comparison. And what you see there is that they track really well up to some point in which they completely go in all, all these different directions, which, you know, you can think about maybe being signal, but probably the most reasonable explanation here is that they're biased uh, predictors and they should not be used, you know, past, some, some given genetic distance. And this raises you know, these types of, of statements that, that appear on, on, on Twitter. I, I cannot tell you what, what those claps mean, but hopefully you can, uh, can uh, appreciate them, that we should you know, generate more data before we start using and comparing polygenic risk scores across different uh, genetic ancestry groupings or across you know, different, uh, different categories of, uh, of distance on genetics. So, Genetic, the, uh, uh, genetic ancestry is just one of the many contexts. And in many ways, we've understood it much better in the past five, six years. But in general, whenever we apply this polygenic resource, it's often the case that the top 
uh, genetic cancers is one of the contexts, but there are many others. And I highlight here recent words that uh, work from you know folks in the audience that show that the prediction varies across this non-genetic uh, context like uh, age, sex, and uh, and social economic status that will essentially tell us a little bit about maybe there's the genetic architecture varies across these contexts, and that's why you know we should be uh, uh, accounting for it. So motivated by, by this work, we ask the question whether this is just one example or this is a, a, a fundamental component of polygenic scoring in humans. So we took back again to, to all of us in, in EK Biobank, we ass assessed as many traits as we could. And the long story short is that this is highly pervasive. So you know, here on this, uh, this plot here, you see this differential of performance in polygenic risk scores. You have multiple polygenic risk scores there on the columns. Contexts are on the top, anywhere from age all the way to you know, where, whether you wear glasses or not. And you see that the performance varies drastically across these different contexts. If you pick an example, guess whether wear glasses or not tells you something about the, whether the prediction is going to be accurate or not. And obviously, this is fundamentally problematic if you want to apply these, uh, these methodologies directly in the data. This is UK Biobank. If we focus actually in the US, which is way more diverse than this, this Biobank, if you look in, in all of us, the problem is way more dramatic. So we see, I, I, I'm not going to go through all the numbers there, but hopefully you can appreciate there's way more coloring and way more numbers in this side of the matrix, really showcasing that the more diverse <laughs> Do not touch my laptop, guys. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So hopefully they, they appreciate you know the, uh, the, this uh, the, all of us. Um, yeah. So, so we we see a way more uh, problematic or impact of context, I should say, in more diverse uh, uh, data sets. And that opens up, you know, you know I, I told you a lot of, of potential problems on how do we move forward. And I, I, I'm also willing to propose a solution. I'm curious how, how everyone thinks about it. So the solution that I will propose for you today, I'm curious, you know, how we all think about it is to start before we take a, a, a PGS, a prediction and try to apply it in, in, a, in a patient population that we want to calibrate it first. So assume that you have a calibration data set that has the same characteristics as the patient population that you want to apply to. And you also have the measured phenotype. Um, and before you think about, oh, this is uh, uh, unrealistic, I'll guide you through the fact that this is already happening. So at least in the US, uh, this is a, a plot of all the biobanks that exist in the medical system and beyond that Emer Kenya's group of green there in the middle, which are data sets. So they're different from UK Biobank in the sense that they are uh, patient data from medical systems in the US that have their stated goal to return results to their patients. So in many ways, they cannot be a better calibration data set than the data set of that patients within that medical system, right? And that's definitely true for UCLA. This is a you know, Biobank that I told you a little bit about it that captures the diversity in Los Angeles and uh, both in terms of genetics as well as, as uh, medical records. And you know, just to point on how this may work, consider the case of LDL that may have differential performance in the prediction across two contexts. So assume that we take all the individuals that we predict an LDL of 120, let's say, and then maybe in the context one where we're, we're, uh, we're worse in, in accuracy, that will lead to higher, higher confident ranges in context one over context two. So maybe in context one, we may predict that this, the prediction would be 120 plus minus 40 uh, as opposed to context two. Obviously this is just a toy example. We can do it more sophisticated with, with, a, with you know, some, some very easy fitting of the data, which I'm not gonna get into it, but by fitting all these contexts together, we can actually disentangle the role of different contexts. And maybe that's one way to, to answer the question that we had yesterday. So for example, in, in, for LDL, Wearing glasses is not a relevant context because it just tags uh, 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 it just tags uh, uh, age. So uh, wearing context should not be thought about it because you know it's just a proxy for age. And then once you account for age in the context, then uh, wearing glasses go, goes away, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, so we can uh, integrate all that stuff together, and then at the end we can really look at the 
prediction essentially across all the individuals and, and and that gives us a way to think about which traits we might need to adjust for a lot in a data set like all of us versus traits that are essentially kind of ready to go, if you will. So the context doesn't matter much. So I'll stop here uh, uh, by hopefully uh, uh, convincing you that causal effects, at least for common variants with respect to polygenic risk scores are highly similar across ancestries, that frequency in LD is a big source of, of confounder that we need to adjust for that we should start thinking about continuum. And then hopefully I made a pitch for biobanks that are embedded in the medical systems as, as a primary source for you know, fixing some of these problems, if you would. So thank you so much for, for listening and I acknowledge all the, all the, the, the funding and all the, all the people that have done a lot of the work and particular consortium that has a stated goal to uh, diversify genomics. Thank you so much. Dr. Kraft uh, asks, patients in health system biobanks may not represent the full patient population, and this can affect both relative and absolute risks. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, and uh, that's one of the caveats of is that the patients within medical system are not a representative sample of the whole uh, 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 populations as a whole, and we need to deal with that. The other problem is that when we think about absolute risk, our estimates that of prevalence or incidence are coming from you know, a concept of self-reported race ethnicity that are, you know, that's what epidemiologists have done in the past. So we need to uh, include those uh, somehow into, into our models. Um, but overall, um, um, I think that's a challenge that we need to, to take on. And maybe that, that's also motivating new data sets that are more representative across, let's say, US, US population or other types of populations that are also collecting more context specific data sets that we can use to uh, estimate those in, in, a, in, a, in a more um, essentially unbiased manner. Um. Bogdan, so probably a misunderstanding on my part, but I'm trying to square the fact that first you showed that the prediction accuracy is very well predicted by the genetic distance, and then you showed that contexts have a large effect, which to me, me would imply that the that very plausible so i'm just wondering if you could yeah, help so me out here that's a, that's a fantastic question I, I, and we we're, we're grappling with that question as well and i think one of the hypotheses that there's uh, there's a mixing of all these contexts across all these ancestries and somehow we're integrating that out when we look at uh, at the, at the linearity across genetic diversity but even when you look at the linearity there there are aspects of it that are non-linear there and uh, you know, uh, which may reflect this context specific, like a subtle point or like a secondary point in those plots about uh, uh, decay of accuracy across genetic genomic status not be well mixed across ancestries and affect specific traits. Yeah, and then part of it is also the, the, the limited data that we're looking at. So there in that data set, we're looking at the UCLA Biobank, which in some ways, because those are all patients that already enter the system, we don't have you know other types of diverse. So the, the limited context also obfuscates some of this, some of these findings, which again, maybe I'll, I'll pose it again as a, as a, we need more data sets that are looking at more diverse contexts if you will, beyond, you know, the, the genetic uh, ancestries. Well, uh, brilliant talk, um, Bogdan. Uh, I was curious about your quite elegant analysis using admixed populations. And so you, you managed to estimate the correlation of causal effects for admixed individuals living in the UK and in the US as well, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so did you see any difference in those genetic correlations across those different environments? I guess they're still, still talking westernized uh, um, sort of populations, but do you see a difference and do you expect a difference if you were to do that in a different population? Um, that's a great, that's a fantastic question. We did not see a difference. So we, we saw like highly consistent, whether you look at, at mixed individuals within, uh, yes, a UK Biobank 
or, or all of us uh, with restriction to uh, African European mixture. However, we, we also looked at the consistency between the, the causal effect on the local ancestry, let's say Africans versus Europeans as different continents. And we saw a much bigger drop. So the, the correlation in the, the causal effects using a similar methodology, Europeans versus Africans, is much lower than European versus African segment within the mixed individuals. And you know, one explanation for that is you know, this GBAE type things. Another explanation that is that we're not doing a, such a great job of correcting for, you know, when we look at the, across continents or across different groups of us. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to move on to our next speaker, um, but plenty for discussion later. So our the second speaker is Jeff Whitehead from uh, Johns Hopkins University. I just. I can't see the screen, sorry. I'm too short for this. All right, where's the exit? Oh, it's all one slide deck? Yeah. Brilliant, okay. Do I use this one? It's easier because I'm shorter, okay. All right, uh, so thanks for having me today. Um, just a heads up that I'm an epidemiologist. Uh, I just asked this as well, but come from an epidemiology background. And so what I'm going to present to you today is sort of how I work through these program these problems and how that affects the research questions that we can ask. So I wouldn't be a, a, a real epidemiologist if I didn't show you some sort of vague pseudo DAG. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is sort of the relationship that we normally think of, which is we think about genetics and how it relates to a trait. And our, most of the time, we think of this as the core question. Oh, down further, okay. Further more, okay. All right, so we think about how we are thinking about the genetics versus the trait, but there's a lot of other things that are going on. How genetic ancestry intersects with the environment and what that means for our genetic risk for human health. And there's a lot of things going on. So we have uh, population genetics in terms of different allele frequencies and LD patterns that affect our genetic score errors or, you know, variance uh, level risks. Um, and then this is sort of confounded and group memberships, um, so the socio-political context in which they exist, how that affects social and structural determinants of health. And then, of course, biomarkers and individual level risk factors. And so there's a lot going on here. And I think most of the time we either try to ignore a lot of this or we just try to adjust it out. When in reality, I think it's a really fundamental way of thinking um, that becomes increasingly more relevant as we move towards polygenic scores. This is from social epidemiology, but this idea of the sort of society behavioral uh, biology nexus, this is from 2006. And what you're seeing here is sort of the, this different framework for looking at how we incorporate different levels. And so you have at the bottom this genomic substrate, the riverbed, um, and you go more and more macro in scale as you go up. And then once you get sort of above the surface, you're going at this point to above um, individual level factors. So micro level factors, meso macro level, and then global level factors. And they all have effects on human health. Um, and so we're just part of, part of it. Uh, and I think one of the fundamental tensions that we have for this is how we reconcile the two sort of sides of things, right? We have the top in which social constructs such as race or ethnicity or other group membership might be most relevant for that. And then we have capture um, in our methods to, to do this. All right. And so when we think about context, I think it's important to note there's many, many different scales of context. So this is sort of looking biomarkers, lifestyle, all the way up to these societal factors that we're going up in terms of scale, um, and they all matter. And I think part of the, the disconnect that we have for this is that we have moved from GWAS, in which maybe the prime motivation was discovery and mechanism, uh, to looking at polygenic score, which is more about population level dynamics that we're capturing, not just the uh, biology, biology, but basically a bunch of correlations that we need to account for across the entire genome. And so as we move from this GWAS to polygenic score, the rest of this context and how macro of a scale it is and moving beyond individuals to 
walk you through some examples of, of what this means in terms of our data uh, in the next few slides. So uh, we're going to use two anthropometric traits as model traits, um, as described earlier today. And we're going to look at height and BMI. So two traits, um, very easily measured in large numbers, but uh, different heritabilities, right? So different contributions of genes. Uh, what matters more, right? So does genetic similarity matter more when looking at differences and distributions between these different traits, these groups? Or does a racial or ethnic identity matter more? Does it explain more? So the social construct of those identities. And what you can see here is the correlation between disease. We do PC1 through 5. And what you see is that for height, there's a strong uh, negative relationship in this data set between height and this PC1. Uh, and then positive for PC3, et cetera. And so you see this differential relationship by PCs for these different uh, traits. And it's sort of noticeable that the traits don't show the same patterns, right? And so this is going to relates to ancestry. Now we can also look at differences in the average height and average BMI within, this is the page study, um, looking at racial ethnic groups. So here with AA, which is African and African American, uh, Asian, and our population, our study population here, you have different average heights and different average BMIs. And so you want to sort of tease apart, is this because of genetic differences? Is this because of more social context being different? So one way to do this is look at the how much of the trait variance is explained, right? So we do a full model where the base model includes age, sex, and study within the page study because page is a um, consortium of consortia. Uh, and so what we're looking at is there's a base model, and then we're adding both the PCs and these sort of racial ethnic categories as factors into the model, as saying we're going to throw everything in there. And then we're going to take one out at a time and see where the biggest loss of information occurs. And what you can see is that for both BMI and height, looking at these sort of broad racial ethnic categories, genetics matters more, right? So when you take out the racial ethnic categories, you don't lose a lot of information that can't be captured by PCs. Right? And this doesn't really sit well with our knowledge of these traits in terms of how heritable it is, um, what's at play in terms of the context. And I would argue that part of this is because of the granularity that you're looking at in these populations. They're very, very broad. They're sort of very um, earlier today. And so it requires precision of who we're looking at to get a better idea of what matters. And so one example that we can do is looking within Hispanic Latino individuals. Within PAGE, we have better granularity for how individuals self-identify. And these include the groups um, in the Caribbean. We have Cuba, uh, Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. And then in the continental sort of Americas, we go from Mexico and then to Central America and South America. Uh, now, unfortunately, Central America and South America had to be combined with the granularity of the data and there's numbers to get power. Um, but we see differences between the average age-adjusted BMI. Right? And so you can see there's differences in the average distribution here. And so it's hard to know, again, is it due to genetics? These find by most people have recent admixture from three or more uh, groups. And so they sort of run uh, the full spectrum of the human diversity. And right, so is it due to genetics, environment, or both? whether this sort of concept of, of group membership and of ethnicity matters um, more than PCs and genetic similarity, we recapitulate what we know about heritability of the trait. Which for BMI, if you remove these sort of ethnic categories, then you lose a lot of more, more information than if you just remove the PCs, right? Which means that this is a construct that matters more for looking at the distribution of this trait. Well, for height, it doesn't matter as much, right? You lose the PCs, you lose a lot of the information, and that tracks what we know about the heritability of the trait itself, right? Okay. So moving forward to a, an actual polygenic score, looking at the genetics of it, um, here I'm showing you the performance of a BMI polygenic score within PAGE, stratified by these different groups. And again, you see that there's differential performance, right, for the adjusted R squared, including a base model of age, sex, and study once again, uh, where you see the The Mexican and Mexican American individuals. And so what is actually going on here? So a lot of times when we present these sort of fully you know, expanded models, we're really covering up what each individual term means. And so we can look at the incremental R squared uh, for each, both the polygenic score, which has been adjusted for 
this um, Amerindigenous ancestry, which is way of in, uh, accounting for the substructure there, um, and then a base model. And what you see here is that if we actually realign these individuals, or the, you know, the groups, uh, the base model itself explains different amounts of variation. This is not unexpected. This is confirmed with epidemiological data where you have basic factors that will explain different amounts of the variation based on the study population from which they are being captured and the prevalence of those factors. What I think is noticeable is that the polygenic score is also different, right? It performs differently in this group. And often what we do is we would pool all these individuals together give them one metric for how well the score is doing, when in reality they have a varied amount of accuracy across these different groups. Another thing to note for this is that the base model itself uh, is different in terms of how much information it's giving to you from the polygenic score, right? So you see that in the Mexican-Mexican-American individuals, it's actually the base model that's doing the least, not the risk score. While you have um, in individuals who identify the Dominican Republic as ancestry, uh, it does the worst, which is um, what we expect with the highest proportion of Africa. To have this precision. Now, is it a matter of just adjusting it out, right? Do we just adjust it out and then have another parameter in our model that we account for this diversity? And the answer is no. Model, our accuracy drops. And the reason is that because there's real relationships between the distributions of this risk score and the outcome within these study populations. So I'm showing you here on the sort of top left-hand side that Puerto Rican individuals are overrepresented in the top quintiles of the polygenic score. Um, you can see in terms of the whole distribution is shifted. And then you can see on the right-hand side what the effect size difference is for that top quintile before and after adjustment for group membership if you had everybody combined together. And what you can see is that for some groups, the, the, the actually goes up. It does a better job of, of discriminating these different groups if you were looking at it at a binary way. Uh, and some it does worse, right? And so again, it's not a one thing fits all. It's not sort of a nuisance parameter. You just throw in and hope it adjusts things out. But it's really fundamental for defining what group you're actually looking at, right, the context. And we can look at this in terms of environmental context. This is work that was led by Lindsay Fernandez Rhodes, who's in the sort of back of the room right now. Um, and what we did is sort of look at the apologetic score for BMI and to see how it performed in an expanded model and how that changed based on measures of immigration, right? And so you're looking here at this, and what I want to point you out is that it also is stratified by the same groups I had before, but this is in the Hispanic Community Health Study and Study of Latinos. Um, with a, the larger model, which is why the R squares are, are larger. And so what you can see off the bat sort of confirms that the model fit is different by background, even after adjustment for a lot of different factors and, a lot, and ancestry. The effect size of the actual PRS also differs by background, even after adjustment. And you see this sort of differences in the different groups and pretty substantial differences in effect sizes. And then what I want to point out here is with the addition of an environmental context, so this is the age of immigration for these individuals. So this has already been adjusted for their current age, but we're looking at what age they were when they came to the United States relative to people who came above the age of 20. And what you're seeing here is this one variable that's sort of very easy to sort of standardize in terms of it being age and immigration. It's sort of a cut and dry variable means different things in different groups. It does different things in different groups because immigration occurs for different reasons in these different groups at different times and to different contexts, both where people immigrate from as well as where they immigrate to, right? And so you have this context is different where a single environmental context that we measure, a single variable, means very different things, again, in different groups. And you see this in other factors where, um, it's often common in environmental epi where you'll look at pollution, right? So pollu air pollution is a you did it in, in uh, New York City and you compare different levels. It's the same monitor, same technology you use to measure it. It means very different things because in New York City, the areas with higher socioeconomic status on average have more air pollution than those with less. And in LA, the areas with more, uh, with lower socioeconomic status have actually higher air pollution. And so again, the same environmental variable, the same measure, same technology means something very And so this goes down to um, just sort of these basic epidemiological concepts of what is your study population? How does that reflect your source population? 
And how does that reflect your target population? Um, one thing I think to note is that we're getting larger and larger data sets, but we're not reaching numbers that actually approximate the full population. So we still have to worry about bias. Just because we have large numbers does not mean we go away from bias. And because of this, we need to have precision in our question. Um, and so I understand this is sort of a trade-off now, right, between power and precision. Weigh the two sides of the coin here. And this matters for GWAS, it matters for sort of all things. So what I'm showing you here is, you know, um, but here's sort of a complementary way of looking at our data is the average sample size of studies that are published. So what I'm showing you here is it's from the GWAS catalog from 2012, 2022, uh, and it's colored by individual, by how the GWAS solid line is the cumulative trends over time, and the dashed lines are um, yearly trends. And what you see is that the average sample size has increased dramatically for European and European ancestries. Um, and this is largely due to biobanks being made more available. But for everybody else, uh, we're not doing very great, right? The sample sizes on average are much smaller, which is a rate limiting step when it comes to discovery and therefore translation to other um, downstream steps. And so again, this is this, this, this trade-off between precision and power looking at this, um, and it gets even sort of more dire if you try to make it more and more precise in terms of your study population and their context. Now this has con consequences for your polygenic scores themselves, right? So the polygenic scores are often built off of GWAS. And what I'm showing you here is of all the published polygenic scores in the PGS catalog earlier this year, the vast majority of them only include European ancestry samples, right? So the solid blue on the left-hand side is a proportion who included only these European ancestries, and the ones with the pluses say they included other people as well, right? And it's majority. So you have a lot of resources now for further work looking at polygenic scores and how they work in populations, uh, but it's not for everyone. Is any of the polygenic scores who included anybody who identified as African American, Afro Caribbean, or Hispanic Latino? And it's a very, very small amount of scores. So if we wanted to look at this data in the US population, this is on the right hand side. Uh, we're in trouble because we just don't have the scores to deal with. So we're moving towards precision medicine and precision health at a sort of great next speed, uh, but we're leaving a large amount of people behind again, which is what we've done time and time again. And so how do we get here? So I swear I had this in my slides before the presentation yesterday, um, but if we look at these sort of genomic health inequities that we see, it's turtles all the way down. And by turtles, I mean this Eurocentric bias, right? It permeates every step of what we're doing from you know, who we sample, how we sample them, discovery, and then translation of these results. And so what it really comes down to, I think, at the base of it is what we accept as the default and what we consider afterthoughts, right? We're just sort of patching up the faulty foundation later on. All, you know, we're, we're method developments and we're statisticians, and so we all make assumptions, right? But I think it's different to make assumptions than it is to assume, to accept a default. Right? And the default permeates sort of the questions we ask, who we include, and the systems we model. And so if we think about equity, we sort of have to rethink the foundation to begin with to make sure that everything that results from it also is an equitable um, consequences. So I'm going to breeze through this because I don't have much time, but what do we need when we move to forward, right? So it's always, always going to say data, right? Data for genetics, data for phenotypes, and data for environmental contexts across these different scales. This includes diversity of the participants and the populations from which they come from, these different contexts. And I think what's really important here is that this requires an incentive structure, right? This requires time and money. It is not incentivized to think about these questions deeply because it requires collaborations across fields. We're all very used to team science, but maybe we're not used to team science that incorporate people from outside of our genetic sphere, right? Which I think is becoming more and more important as we move forward. And so we need to do that in sort of moving forward to actually look at how these risk scores might perform in different groups and even how much genetics matters across these different contexts. And then lastly, you know, one thing we think about is this mind, what systems are in place and how can we change them? This is from the GWAS catalog a couple of years ago. And what you can see here is that the demographics for the GWAS catalog in terms of participants, they don't reflect the world population. They do not reflect the US population, but sadly, if you look around the room, they kind of resemble us, which I think is a little 
a little embarrassing. Um, I think most of us didn't go into this for ourselves, but we sort of need to do better in terms of the diversity of the participants and the populations that we work with. And so I'll just leave you with a thought as, as we move towards this precision health for genomics, sort of who is it actually precise for? And a lot of acknowledgments, um, and I'll, I'll end because I know I'm out of time. So thank you. your talk and, and Bogdan's talk, mm -hmm. do you have a sense of, of how much effort we should put into sampling genetic diversity versus environmental diversity? I mean, obviously that's kind of a, uh, an open-ended question, but. Yeah, it's like picking your favorite child. Um, you know, I think that it, it's, we have to do something even before that, which I think that there's no point in sampling increase genetic diversity if we don't have methods that account for the full spectrum and allow for the full spectrum in the way that Bogdan showed before, where you have individuals who are unclassified and who are arbitrary. So that's sort of, you know, more of a foundational question for that. Um, and I, you know, I know it's NHGRI, so obviously genetics is the most important part of this, uh, but this requires collaboration, I think, between the institutes as well. And so, possibly getting, you know, this sort of collaboration, not just being on us, but also the institutions. Um, and so, again, I, that's not an answer to your question because I can't choose, but uh, that's, it's that's everything. Fair that's fair enough. And, yeah. and a question from online from, from Timothy Rabin. So it, this is really about cost, and, and maybe yeah. this gets to one of your points. So some Eurocentric, bio, for example, UK Biobank are, yeah. are free to use or relatively free. And some more diverse biobanks, for example, all of us cost more money to use. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that the cost of accessing the data is is a barrier to, to the sort of uh, applications you're describing? Yes and no. So it definitely is a barrier in terms of people um, doing this research. And I think, you know, especially from, from groups that are not as well funded, both in the United States and sort of globally. Um, but I also think that there is a lot of work that's being done in much smaller data sets that are not in biobanks that is very valuable. And it's being done in a careful way, like the study I, I showed before by uh, Lindsay, um, and where the sample heads are much smaller, but you can get a really good idea of what's going on. And working with those collaborators is much lower cost and, and should be done as encouraged as well. Great. Okay, so I, I think we have to move on to our next speaker. So our last speaker in this session is Abdul Abdelawi. Um, and uh, from the uh, Amsterdam University Medical Center. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, NIH, for inviting me to be part of this amazing crowd of people. Um, I'm going to tell you something about uh, genome-wide association studies. It didn't take long before we realized that sample sizes are key in uh, in increasing uh, genetic signals. So appropriately, the uh, sample sizes have in more than tripled uh, over the past five years. But we are all gathered here to try to understand the content of uh, those signals. So what we did here, we um, downloaded all of the GWAS summary statistics from GWAS catalogs, or the thousands of uh, summary statistics, and did some QC filtering. The strongest filter was on sample size, so it had to have at least 50,000 uh, participants. In order to uh, get some decent estimates for, uh, of genetic correlations between traits, because we made a very big genetic correlation matrix with all pairwise uh, genetic correlations between all traits, and then did a principal component analysis on, uh, those, uh, on, on that matrix to see what the largest patterns of variation are uh, in all of these GWASs that we are uh, conducting. And these were, uh, these explain the most variation, these, these five, uh, I think around 35% of the variation. And this first principal component explained 10% of the variance. We uh, called it cognition and socioeconomic status, but the strongest loadings are for uh, uh, 
in these GWASs actually, educational attainment and income, well, mostly educational attainment. Income, there aren't that many GWASs of that, but that shows a genetic correlation of larger than 0.9 with uh, educational attainment. And this is a very interesting uh, signal uh, that, that's so ubiquitous uh, across all these uh, GWASs. And if you uh, look at processes that, uh, things that influence the genetic makeup of a population, so things like uh, uh, my, uh, migration, assortative mating, uh, uh, fecundity, how many children people have, these signals uh, are most strongly associated with those kinds of outcomes. But what do these uh, signals contain exactly? I mean, there are, we know there are no genetic variants that encode for your uh, uh, diploma or uh, your, the, the money on your bank account. These are uh, influence, these, these genetic effects travel through very low level uh, biological processes that we talked about all day yesterday. And those influence traits and those traits influence each other the, uh, and, and influence what environment you are exposed to and that environment influences you and those traits and perhaps those biological processes and all of that gets captured in uh, the GWAS signal. So the, the stack of turtles that Xander showed us yesterday that's been uh, mentioned a couple of times today, well that figure uh, right there, that is our stack of turtles. And this paper helped expose the turtle on top. So this, this was not what we set out to do. We uh, tried to look at the geographic distribution of polygenic scores. So we uh, collected GOSs on a wide range of traits, physical, mental health, behavior, personality, any GOS that we could get our hands on that was big and did not include the UK Biobank. We used to build polygenic scores for the uh, 450,000 individuals uh, that fall in the European ancestry cluster in uh, UK Biobank. And then we looked at the geographic clustering. So did, here on the x-axis you see, uh, let me see, can I get that arrow? On the x-axis you see the Moran's eye, that's a measure for geographic clustering, this spatial autocorrelation. And before controlling for ancestry, a lot of the polygenic scores so, showed substantial geographic clustering. Uh, a lot of it looked like those uh, beautiful geographic distributions from the PCs, uh, this, those reflect ancestry differences within the country. Often they um, are in line with geographic barriers or cultural barriers here. Often you see the difference between Wales, England and Scotland. We're not sure why many of these polygenic scores show these distributions. It could be uh, a lot of the things that Bogdan talked about or uh, maybe there are actual differences between those ancestries or the GWASs did not control well enough for uh, population stratification. But that's not what we were interested in. So we controlled for the first 100 principal components, and then we saw all of the geographic clustering drop, except for one uh, polygenic score, and that was educational attainment. And when you plot that on a map, you see the same map as the socioeconomic differences in the country. So you, you see the Townsend Index next to the uh, polygenic score distribution. And those black lines, those are coal mining regions. The coal mining industry collapsed between the 20s and the 80s in the past century. A lot of joblessness in those uh, areas, and a lot of uh, environmental stressors. It's very different to live in uh, those regions than in the rest of uh, Great Britain. And See, half of this figure uh, dropped, not sure why, but the, uh, what it shows is that people that were born inside the coal mining regions have a higher polygenic score on average than the rest of the country. And um, but this figure actually shows the same, but longitudinally. So we uh, split them up into different birth cohorts. And you see this red line, the, these, coal, uh, 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 the, these are from the people born in the coal mining regions, that drops faster than the blue lines. And this green line here, that comes from this red line. So there's a, and that's 
they show consistently a higher polygenic score than the rest of the country. These are the people that migrated out of the coal mining region. So there's sort of a brain drain going on that is detectable on the genetic level that is increasing these regional uh, differences. And this shows uh, a, a similar, uh, this is another way to show the effect of migration. So we compared birthplace with uh, current address. And you see that the variance explained by region increases when uh, you look at current address compared to uh, birthplace. And for the principal components, so those old, uh, older ancestry patterns, those decrease. So you have those old geographic pa uh, patterns of ancestry. Those get broken up by these more recent uh, migrations that are driven by uh, socioeconomic forces. And just two weeks ago, this preprint came out uh, that did exactly the same analyses in the Estonian biobank, about 180,000 genotyped people, about 20% of their population. And they see exactly the same thing happening. So the uh, geographic clustering increases because of the migration for the polygenic score of educational attainment, while for the PCs, for all of the PCs, the geographic clustering decreases. So that those older ancestry patterns get broken up and if you plot the polygenic score for educational attainment in Estonia, you see that this is largely driven by um, uh, these two university towns, Tartu and uh, Tallinn. And they also looked at a lot of polygenic scores. They, uh, we looked at 33 and they looked at, at more than 160, I think, and they saw the same outlier, the one for uh, uh, educational attainment. And here on the x-axis, you see the correlation between the other trait and educational attainment. And the higher the genetic correlation for the other trait with educational attainment is, the stronger the geographic clustering uh, becomes. We saw the same thing in UK, Bi UK Biobank. So here on the x-axis, you have the measure for geographic clustering. And on the y-axis, the absolute genetic correlation with educational attainment with intelligence that's about half of that signal here uh, on top. And so this GWAS on educational attainment, it captures this collection of uh, traits that influence how well you do in school or how well you do in uh, society. And um, uh, these, all of these traits get clustered not randomly as i said earlier it's very different to live in a in a poorer region of the country than in the richer region especially in uh, the uk which is the most unequal country in northern uh, europe and here you see the geographic distribution of clearly an environmental variable the number of fast food restaurants in uh, in the region and that shows the same distribution as that uh, polygenic score so you get genetic effects and environmental effects clustering geographically, and they're hard to disentangle. So in this paper, we looked at whether these uh, gene environment correlations, whether they extend beyond the family, or were before this uh, many studies that showed that polygenic scores predict the family environment as well as uh, genetic effects. And we, uh, we looked at that here, so that's passive gene environment correlations. You get born into a family, the parents pass down their genetics, but also the rearing environment. But what we also saw was that as these siblings grow up, the sibling with the higher polygenic score is more likely to move to a region with um, uh, healthier environmental influences. So that's active gene environment correlation. And what we also did, we ran GWASs on more than 50 traits uh, related to physical and mental health and uh, a lot of other stuff. And controlled for where people were born or uh, where they migrated to or both. And we saw that the genetic correlation with educational attainment decreased after controlling for the geographic region for almost all of these uh, traits, most strongly for BMI uh, and, and substance use. So the traits related to what you put in your uh, body. And this shows a similar um, 
affect this figure. Uh, so let's, if you focus on height here, what, uh, you see that on an individual level, polygenic score for educational attainment explains about 1% of the individual differences in height. And the polygenic score for height explains 21% of the individual differences in height. It's a pretty good polygenic score, but not the one that Loic uh, talked about. But when you take the regional average of height and of uh, the polygenic scores, then suddenly educational attainment outperforms uh, the polygenic score for height because on a regional level, this polygenic score also predicts these regional environmental uh, differences. So here's the, the map, the actual map of the height polygenic score and then the uh, map of the uh, phenotypic height. And um, those are not the same. And uh, here is that polygenic score for educational attainment again. And you see that if it was all genetics, then the people from those coal mining regions should be the tallest of the country. But now they seem to be uh, uh, among the shortest. So, so these, these environmental influences that cluster with these uh, genetic effects that are associated with educational attainment, they influence a very wide range of traits and also educational attainment itself. So if you control for the region of, uh, of birth or of the current address for educational attainment, you see the SNP-based heritability substantially uh, decrease. And um, that is, I think, because we as a society, we make these genetic effects stronger we reward certain genetic propensities of the traits that we value in society with a better environment and uh, uh, leave the people uh, uh, that lack those propensities or have a, a lower uh, propensity with a worse environment. So if you see that a child does well in school, he gets sent to a better school with better teachers and is more likely to grow up and uh, find a better job and be able to afford to live in a better neighborhood. And in that neighborhood, he's more likely to meet a spouse who has the same genetic and economic luck. Assortative mating also shows the, the, the strongest effects for uh, these signals. And over time, this could make society more unequal and also make our jobs harder, makes studying uh, genetic effects more difficult because these Genetic effects and environmental influences are very difficult to tease apart. Just controlling for the region that people live in is just a very rude proxy of someone's uh, social environment. So we have to think carefully about how we apply these, um, these, these signals, these polygenic signals. So this is one of the more controversial applications of polygenic scores, screening embryos uh, in IVF treatments for their polygenic risk. So this is the first baby that was, has been born from such a procedure. Uh, her name is Aurea, it says here. Arne Aurea doesn't know it yet, but her birth was very special. She is the world's first PGTP baby, meaning that the, uh, she is statistically less likely than the rest of us to develop a genetic disease or disorder throughout her life. So this is from the frequency, frequently asked questions section from the website of the company that assisted in her birth. It says, does genomic prediction screen purely cosmetic traits? No, we only provide risk scores for polygenic traits related to disease. And the other question is, does genomic prediction clinical laboratory screen embryos for increased intelligence? And the answer is no. So I took GWAS is for all of the traits that they screen their embryo for. So you have uh, brain disorders, uh, heart diseases, cancers, and inflammatory bowel disease and type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And I computed the genetic correlation with uh, a whole range of non-disease traits, so anthropomorphic traits like height and BMI, reproductive traits, substance use, uh, some psychological dimensions, and educational attainment and IQ. And of course, it's no surprise that these genetic correlations are significant all over the place um, because there is a lot of uh, pleiotropy that was discussed yesterday in length. But we are starting to see that these, this, this pleiotropy does not happen on a just strictly biological level, but also through our environment, through the social environment specifically, through the way we organize our society and the way we uh, create 
social inequality that explains a substantial part of these uh, genetic correlations. So I want to thank these wonderful, my wonderful colleagues. I'm very happy to uh, work with them. Uh, some of them are sitting in this room. So thank you very much. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. you. You briefly mentioned a sort of mating. I was just wondering to what degree is this geographic clustering just tracking the degree of a sort of mating across those different traits? Yeah, I think I, um, I'm not sure to what degree exactly, but I am pretty sure that those two are related because if, if it, they cluster, they're also more likely to uh, meet each other. So, um, yeah, we are planning to, to look at uh, how much of assortative mating is influenced by this geographic uh, proximity. Um, yeah, that's something we have to look at empirically, but it's a very good question. Those two are closely linked, I think. Yeah. I have a quick question. Um, I was wondering, you know, given the educational systems in the UK and Estonia, how do you think that these results would translate to like the US where the educational system is sort of very different in terms of, you know, educational attainment and who has access to higher education? Um, yeah, that's, uh, um, that's a good question. I think, uh, I suspect that it's going to look uh, similar. Um, you, uh, a lot of the migration here is also related to uh, education, either education or uh, other economic uh, reasons. Um, but that's something we'll have to look at empirically. I would love it if someone that has access to these big data sets in the US could uh, have a look at it. Peter. Yes, so a lot of your results show there's a, um, a gene, as you call it, gene environment correlation or co covariance, and, and that if you have, you know, sort of population studies like GWAS, that that influences your estimates of your, and the interpretation of your associations. But what you did mention is uh, that there are experimental designs that break that up. If you look within families, for example, and people yeah. obviously have been doing this and, mm -hmm. and will do more of it. And you can see for those traits, enormous differences in, in effect sizes, you know, yeah. with it, with it at the, within family versus population level. So that's quite interesting, I find. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and they also, they, they see, is a similar decrease in, in the heritability of traits that are closely related to educational attainment. Um, but they also see for other traits that the, their genetic correlation with educational attainment drops when you look at within family, similar to what when we controlled for region, which is effectively a within region uh, GWAS. Her? Um, Lindsay Fernandez Rose, Penn State University. Thank you, Abdel. Uh, I really appreciated that you, for the first time, brought up life course perspective by looking at birthplace and then current address. Uh, when you plotted it out, you could look at the various categories and how certain groups would be differentially affected. Have you done something similar looking at socioeconomic status or educational attainment of a parent uh, compared to the individual once they reach adulthood and compared those? Uh, further kind of deepening your life course understanding of what's going on? Um, no, I haven't done that. Uh, it's uh, uh, a bit more challenging to do that in UK Biobank because there is not a lot of parent-child uh, observations. But Michel Nifari has looked at uh, in MOBA who have collected parents and their children. And um, yeah, he's going to sit here later. Maybe you want to comment on it. I don't know what you found or... Like, I think you're right. We should do a lot, lot more of that. And and when when you bring in like parents, but also parents of parents, there's like a whole new set of association tests you can do, right? You can like think about what Peter said. You can do a within sibling association, and and you could also do within sibling associations stratified by region. So there's like combinations and crosses of those kind of things you can do for like regional differences with. Uh, Rosa Cheeseman did some really cool work on that. 
uh, in MOBA, where they have parents and offspring, like 100,000 trios, basically, um, where you do both controlling for gene environment correlation using the parents, but then you can also do the interaction with regional things. And, you know, as we all know, you know, estimating either correlation or interaction just risks the other one, like, mucking everything up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we have ten minute break. So back at ten fifty seven. Yeah.